Imagine for a moment you're at a funeral of a beloved uncle. He's one of those guys who knew a ton of people, resulting in a massive who's who of attendees. Then imagine yourself amongst all your other cousins and uncles and other not-so-distant relatives. Usually, this sort of event is something of a cathartic experience amid sadness at a funeral, right? But now introduce some family drama into the mix. Let's say there's some history between you and a few other family members. Makes this gathering a bit more uncomfortable. But let's tweak this a little more. How about you're all unimaginably rich, and you each have enormous standing armies with hundreds of thousands of men. On top of that, you all know that someone in the near future is going to start a war, but no one knows who, though there are some prime suspects in the group. So much for the funeral, right? This quaint little family gathering is turned into something far more consequential, something far more explosive. The event I'm trying to relate is exactly what this Almost episode is about. Or better, it's about the men who posed for perhaps the most ominous photo ever taken in human history. These men are the Nine. The 20th century began with a funeral. King Edward VII of England was dead. Just weeks earlier, this chain-smoking son of Queen Victoria had been suffering from bronchitis, followed by heart attack after heart attack. Surrounded by his family in Buckingham Palace, he was pronounced dead on May 6th at 11.45 p.m. On May 11th, his body was adorned in his majestic uniform and lovingly placed in an oak coffin in the throne room to lay in state. The room was sealed and guards were posted at the door. Edward was affectionately, or perhaps for some, unaffectionately, nicknamed the, quote, Uncle of Europe, as he was related to just about every single royal family throughout the continent. Barbara Tuckman untangles some of these familial relations in The Guns of August, noting that he was, quote, the uncle not only of Kaiser Wilhelm, but also, through his wife's sister, the Dowager Empress Maria of Russia, of Tsar Nicholas II. His own niece, Alex, was the Tsarina, his daughter Maud was Queen of Norway. Another niece, Anna, was Queen of Spain. A third niece, Marie, was soon to be Queen of Romania. The Danish family of his wife, besides occupying the throne of Denmark, had mothered the Tsar of Russia and supplied kings to Greece and Norway. Other relatives, the progeny at various removes of Queen Victoria's nine sons and daughters, were scattered in abundance throughout the courts of Europe. End quote. In life... Edward was at the forefront of fashion, popularizing much of the 20th century men's dress for decades to come. He was also a supreme patron of the arts and sciences. He was an avid sport hunter, and he had once caused a national scandal by gambling. He was one of the most popular kings the realm had ever had. As Big Ben rang 68 times, once for each year in the life of the late king, over 400,000 people flooded in to view his body. Among them were the premier royalty of Europe to pay their respects to their uncle. And thus, out of Westminster Hall came a procession the likes of which the world would never see again. The pinnacle of the procession was not Edward's casket, but the nine kings in tow. And I'll let Barbara Tuckman's eloquence paint the picture. Quote, so gorgeous was the spectacle on the May morning of 1910 when nine kings rode in the funeral of Edward VII of England that the crowd, waiting and hushed in black-clad awe, could not keep back gasps of admiration. In scarlet and blue and green and purple, three by three the sovereigns rode through the palace gates with plumed helmets, gold braids, crimson sashes, and jeweled orders flashing in the sun. After them came five heirs apparent, forty more imperial or royal highnesses, seven queens, four dowager and three regnant, and a scattering of special ambassadors from uncrowned countries. Together, they represented seventy nations in the greatest assemblage of royalty and rank ever gathered in one place and, of its kind, the last. The muffled tongue of Big Ben told nine by the clock as the cortege left the palace. But on history's clock, it was sunset, and the sun of the old world was setting in a dying blaze of splendor, never to be seen again. After the kings came the royal highnesses, Prince Fushima, brother of the Emperor of Japan, Grand Duke Michael, brother of the Tsar of Russia, the Duke of Aosta, in bright blue with green plumes, brother of the King of Italy, 
Prince Carl, brother of the King of Sweden, Prince Henry, consort of the Queen of Holland, and the Crown Princes of Serbia, Romania, and Montenegro. There were a Prince of Siam, a Prince of Persia, five princes of the former French royal house of Orléans, a brother of the Khedive of Egypt, wearing a gold-tasseled fez, Prince Sai Tao of China, in an embroidered light blue gown whose ancient dynasty had two more years to run, and the Kaiser's brother, Prince Henry of Prussia, representing the German navy, of which he was commander-in-chief. Amid all this magnificence were three civilian-coated gentlemen, Mr. Gaston Carlin of Switzerland, Mr. Pichon, foreign minister of France, and former President Theodore Roosevelt, special envoy of the United States. End quote. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, on this day, May 20th, those nine kings leading the funeral procession paused to take a photo that one could argue is worth... 20 million lives. These kings, these men who were nearly all related to one another through the late King Edward VII, would soon find the continent of Europe, their thrones, and their own countries turned upside down in World War I. King Hakan VII of Norway perhaps got off the easiest. He ascended to the throne when the union between Sweden and Norway fell apart. Prince Carl, as he was once known, with his wife being the daughter of King Edward VII, was the easy choice to be Norway's new king. He became king, took the old Norse name Hakan, and when World War I finally did happen, his country was officially neutral and was subsequently spared much loss. Although, he did aid Britain with logistics and men. He lived a long life, dying at the age of 85 in 1952, and has the distinction of being the first Norwegian king since 1387. Oddly enough, King Hakan's own father is in this photo of the nine kings. His father was King Frederick VIII of Denmark, who ascended to his throne at the age of 62 and died about two years before the Great War commenced. He was struck down by a heart attack while walking incognito in the streets of his beloved country, a country which maintained total neutrality during the war. George I of Greece also never made it to World War I, though his country did, ascending the throne at the young age of 17 and replacing a deposed king at that, his reign seemed ominous from the beginning. King Edward VII, whose funeral he was attending, was his brother-in-law, and the new king of England, George V, was his nephew, along with the previously mentioned King Hakan of Norway. As King George of Greece was decimating the Ottomans in war and approaching his 50th anniversary of rule, he was planning on abdicating and allowing his son to take the throne. Yet, on March 18, 1913, while out for a quiet stroll with almost no security, a man walked up behind him and put a bullet through his heart. When World War I broke out, the country was utterly split. Two separate governments formed, one was pro-German, the other pro-Allies. And Greece finally hopped into the conflict in 1917 on the side of the Allies. King Manuel II of Portugal, too, fell victim to the collapse of the Old World. He ascended to the throne after witnessing the assassination of his father and his older brother by Republican revolutionaries. Those revolutionaries would eventually overthrow the unfortunate king and force him into exile in England. As for his own country's participation in World War I, they did their best to remain neutral, but in the end, they lost 12,000 soldiers to the conflict. On top of that... They lost over 130,000 men, women, and children to the Spanish flu, and another 80,000 from starvation. King Ferdinand I of Bulgaria, or you may know him better as Tsar Ferdinand Maximilian Karl Leopold Marie of saxe coburg and Gotha, eventually brought his country in on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary, despite him thinking the Kaiser a, quote, idiot. As the disastrous war drew to a close, Ferdinand's throne was sinking into a mire of political instability. And in a futile attempt to prevent the inevitable revolution, he abdicated so his son could take the reins. His son immediately surrendered to the Allies and relinquished massive territories. Ferdinand took his wealth and exiled himself. After the war, his son who took the throne was dead. Poisoning was suspected. His replacement, Ferdinand's other son, was dethroned by a communist coup. And then during the revolution, Ferdinand lost another son by execution. From exile, Ferdinand lamented, quote, Everything is collapsing around me. End quote. Ferdinand eventually died in 1948, and his last wish was to be buried in Bulgaria, but the communist government absolutely forbid it.
King Alfonso XIII of Spain was born a king as his father had passed while he lay in the womb. He inherited a shadow of a former power. Poverty was widespread and worsening. Various national movements were picking up in steam, and the United States had just exposed the decayed state of the empire in the Spanish-American War. Although Alfonso kept his nation out of World War I, it did become the unfortunate namesake for the disease that killed more people than the war itself. Soon, Alfonso was forced into exile as his country descended into civil war. By 1933, his oldest sons rejected their claims to the throne, and he was dead by 1941. And we now come to one of the most infamous men of the 20th century, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Barbara Tuckman describes him aptly as he rode in the procession of King Edward VII. Quote, Mounted on a gray horse, wearing the scarlet uniform of a British field marshal, carrying the baton of that rank, the Kaiser had composed his features behind the famous upturned mustache in an expression grave to severity. He had come to bury Edward his bane, Edward the arch plotter, as William conceived it, of Germany's encirclement. Edward, his mother's brother, whom he could neither bully nor impress, whose fat figure cast a shadow between Germany and the sun. Quote, he is Satan. You cannot imagine what a Satan he is. End quote. The Kaiser inherited a shiny new empire, carefully constructed and nurtured by the brilliant Otto von Bismarck. But this new Kaiser was not looking to fill some ceremonial role. He wanted to run Germany the way he saw that it needed to be done and he wanted to expand Germany's territories fast. Germany's decade-long designs to invade France were activated in response to an assassination of an archduke, as we all know, and World War I commenced. By the end of the war, the Kaiser had become a military autocrat who was mistrusted by his own people, he had lost all loyalty from his own army, and he was regarded as damn near evil by the rest of the world, and he had also caught the Spanish flu. On November 9, 1918, Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated. Later that day, Germany was declared a republic. Otto von Bismarck, some 20 years earlier, had entirely predicted the Kaiser's downfall. William II found exile in the Netherlands where he would spend the rest of his life. His cousin, King George V, labeled him, quote, the greatest criminal in history, end quote. The ascendancy of King George V began with his father's funeral and this ominous photo op. Do yourself a favor and look up this photo. It's a remarkable moment in history. King George is seated on a chair, front row, center, and standing directly behind him is his cousin, the Kaiser. On top of the slaughter of World War I, King George's reign was met with many difficulties. All of the great social-political movements of the 20th century blossomed under his nose. Ireland went into a state of damn near total rebellion, and India was headed that way too. Two of his most prominent cousins, Wilhelm, obviously, and Nicholas of Russia, both lost their empires. One became his mortal enemy and was forced into exile. The other was executed by his own people. As King George V lay on his deathbed in 1936, he caught his nurse giving him a sedative. The king could barely talk, but he was able to mumble, quote, God damn you, end quote. His physician, Lord Dawson of Penn, then did something remarkably brazen. He injected the king with a lethal dose of morphine and cocaine, effectively euthanizing him. Neither the king nor his very religious family were consulted in this decision. And this incident was not entirely confirmed until the mid-1980s when Dawson's journal was made public. One of the reasons he gave for this action, apart from generally being in favor of euthanasia, was to ensure the king's death would be reported in the morning papers instead of the, quote, less appropriate evening journals, end quote. But that is only eight kings. The ninth king, who appeared in the photo, is the tallest and standing at the far right and looks the most disinterested of the group. He was also the last among them in the funeral procession. From Tuckman, quote, Dazzled by these splendid mounted princes, as the Times called them, few observers had eyes for the ninth king, the only one among them who is to achieve greatness as a man. Despite his great height and perfect horsemanship, Albert, King of the Belgians, who disliked the pomp of royal ceremony, contrived in that company to look both embarrassed and absent-minded. He was then 35 and had been on the throne barely a year. In later years, when his face became known to the world as a symbol of heroism and tragedy, it still always wore that abstracted look, as if his mind were on something else. End quote. 
Albert I of Belgium, in just four short years, would see his cousin, the Kaiser, the man standing little more than two feet to his right in that photo, would send the German Imperial Army pouring into Belgium, entirely rolling up his small country. Before the war, Albert was immediately popular due to his quaint style and his devotion to his family. It probably also helped that he wasn't a horrific monster of a man like his uncle and predecessor, Leopold II. During the war, Albert fought alongside his men in the trenches, and his wife worked on the front as a nurse. By the end of the war, King Albert led the offensive that finally broke the German grip on his country, allowing him to triumphantly enter Brussels with his queen and his children at his side. The photo taken at this historic funeral is such a strange thing to happen at such a strange time in history. This moment is quite literally a hinge of fate. Through the gas and barbed wire of World War I, the old world came crashing down. To be a king is strange enough already. There's always a chance that you'll lose your kingship. But to be a king in a time when the entire world decides that monarchy as a whole is going to be left in the dustbin of history? That's quite another thing. King Ferdinand of Bulgaria, who we already mentioned, wrote an interesting few lines on how an exiled king copes with losing his position. And I think I'll close with his words. Quote, Kings in exile are more philosophic under reverses than ordinary individuals, but our philosophy is primarily the result of tradition and breeding, and do not forget that pride is an important item in the making of a monarch. We are disciplined from the day of our birth and taught the avoidance of all outward signs of emotion. The skeleton sits forever with us at the feast. It may mean murder, it may mean abdication, but it serves always to remind us of the unexpected. Therefore... We are prepared, and nothing comes in the nature of a catastrophe. The main thing in life is to support any condition of bodily or spiritual exile with dignity. If one sups with sorrow, one need not invite the world to see you eat it. I positioned this episode to follow my Tolkien episode because of the title. For those of you who aren't as big nerds as me, the Nine is a reference to Tolkien's Nine Kings of Men who are corrupted by their greed and power. Quote, Nine for mortal men doomed to die, one for the Dark Lord on his dark throne, in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. End quote. I hope you enjoyed this almost episode. I sure did. If you feel the show is worth at least a dollar, please head over to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash history, and sign up to become a patron. Every dollar helps me purchase material, and it maintains the cost of this whole thing. For those of you who are patrons already, I sincerely appreciate you. Another big way to help is to leave a rating or a review wherever you listen to this podcast, and believe me, each rating helps me organically find new listeners. It's, it's an invaluable help to me. If you want to get a hold of me, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at sdijulius, that's S-D-I-J-U-L-I-U-S, or shoot me a message on the Written in Blood Facebook page. I'm pretty active there, too. And so until next time, thank you so very much for listening to Written in Blood History. See you later.